Some of you know I'm a uh, professor of physics at University of Washington, and my father-in-law, Sebe Sensei, asked me to talk to you about the main subject of my research, which is one of the fundamental particles of nature called the neutrino. Uh, if the neutrino is unfamiliar to you, uh, well, to be honest, that's not a problem. I also did not really know what the neutrino was uh, until I started researching it. And uh, that's natural to not know about it, uh, because the neutrino works behind the scenes and kind of stays hidden from us. Uh, and yet, our very existence uh, relies on this tiny particle. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, we can't see or touch or sense the neutrino, but it's actually the second most plentiful particle in the universe. There's roughly one neutrino for every three photons, every three particles of light. Most of those were born during the Big Bang and have just been zooming towards us from the edge of the known universe since the dawn of time. Almost all of them go straight through us uh, to a neutrino. An atom, like the atoms in our body, looks like a swarm of bugs that it can easily pass through, uh, only very rarely hitting an electron or a proton or a neutron inside of the atoms. The brightest source of neutrinos near us is the Sun. The Sun shines in neutrinos just like it shines with light. If our eyes could see neutrinos, we would see the heart of the Sun, where the, where the neutrinos are being, being created, in the hydrogen fusion processes that are the source of the Sun's energy. Without the neutrino, hydrogen fusion could not take place, and the Sun would not shine at all. So the warmth we receive from the sun comes to us in part thanks to neutrinos. Actually, the uh, Earth itself would also not be here if it wasn't for the neutrino. The material that makes up the Earth was originally made in a gigantic supernova uh, in an ancient star. Uh, it started out mostly as hydrogen inside the star. And when the star's fusion energy burned out, the interior of the star collapsed as protons in the hydrogen started changing into neutrons by emitting neutrinos. Uh, then the supernova blast splattered a, uh, a hot proton-neutron soup from its core into the uh, outer surroundings. And then uh, that soup uh, clumped into highly radioactive elements and then they, it cooled down and it decayed into, uh, into the elements that we know by emitting more neutrinos. So neutrinos made that possible as well. So the result was a giant dust cloud spewing out into the cosmos filled with, uh, with things like carbon, oxygen, silicon, and all of our favorite elements that make up us and the Earth. That dust was the original ingredients of our solar system, and some of that clumped together and formed the Earth. And so in a very literal sense, we are all made of stardust, which came about thanks to neutrinos. However, it's possible that the neutrino is responsible for even more than that. Our models of the Big Bang describe a newborn universe filled with a hot plasma of matter and antimatter in equal parts. And that then cools down as the universe is, uh, expands over time. Today when we look out in the universe though, we see a multitude of stars and galaxies made of only matter and no antimatter. And one of the biggest, biggest mysteries in cosmology today is how a universe made only of matter arose from ingredients containing equal parts of matter and antimatter. And the best exp explanation we have come up with so far points to the neutrino as perhaps being responsible. In these models, the neutrino that we know and love has a big brother that we haven't discovered yet. And uh, that uh, big neutrino is much heavier. And in the first instance after the Big Bang, there's a huge number of these big heavy neutrinos flying around. And then as the universe started to cool down, those would decay and transform into lighter forms of matter and antimatter. And the key is that that heavy neutrino can maybe turn into matter more often than antimatter, and often enough to generate the contents of the entire known universe today. So in other words, your oldest ancestors might be neutrinos. 
if this model is right, it predicts that we should see extremely rare events of matter creation in the laboratory. And that's what I actually spend about 90% of my time trying to do. Uh, it also predicts that neutrinos and antineutrinos, antimatter version of neutrinos, uh, that they should behave differently, slightly differently. And there are new giant neutrino projects being constructed, including one in Japan called Hyper Kamiokande, that are hoping to detect that subtle difference as well. And neutrino physicists like myself are very excited about these possibilities, and we're working really hard to see if they're true. Okay, so I'll now try to bring this science lecture back to uh, Geratsu's study. Uh, it's amazing to me how much we benefit from the neutrino. And yet throughout the history of humanity, we have had no concept of it until about 80 years ago. Humans have gazed at the sun for thousands of years, wondering why it shines. Uh, we now know that the neutrino plays an important role, not only in that, but in many other aspects of our existence as well. You might say we owe the neutrino our gratitude, uh, but if it feels strange to feel gratitude towards a subatomic part particle, uh, perhaps another way to look at it is to recognize the humbling fragility and wonder of our existence. What else remains still hidden from us to which we owe our lives? And maybe more importantly, how can I make the most of this wonderful gift of the lives of myself and those around me? Uh, when I'm not absorbed in research, that's the question I try to answer every day. So, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you.